This is the politics of everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast. So while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Journalism is a subject that means more to me than almost anything else. Why? I started my career as a print journalist 20 years ago, but long before that had a passion for the daily news. Even as a kid, I recall growing up in suburban Australia where the evening news was always watched religiously and my father read the newspapers cover to cover every morning and ABC News Radio was constantly on. Today's guest is Julie Pacetti, an award-winning Australian journalist and academic. She's the author of a major UNESCO study, Protecting Journalism Sources in the Digital Age. She's worked at Fairfax Media, publisher of Australia's oldest newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, and is former editor, presenter and reporter with the ABC, our national broadcaster. In 2014 to 15, she was based in Paris as a research fellow and editor with the World Editors Forum and the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers. Previously an assistant professor and lecturer in journalism at two Australian universities, she currently is a fellow journalism fellow at the University of Wollongong. Julie's consulted widely to media organisations on the digital transformation of journalism, a big topic, and delivered extensive social media training. She knows her stuff, as they say. So I'm thrilled she's with me today to dig deep into the politics of journalism. Welcome, Julie. Thanks for having me, Anna. So let's get right to the nitty-gritty. How did you start your career in journalism? Yes, that is a nitty-gritty because of the distant past. <laughs> ne- nearly 30 years ago, I began as a, a, a cadet journalist, we used to call um, trainee journalists back in the day. Um, so we're talking late 1980s, and um, I applied for... Uh, a, a number of jobs straight out of school, or actually straight straight out of school, um, with a, an intervening period as an exchange student in Germany. So, you know, using snail mail, applied for a lot of jobs from my um, from my um, uh, experience as, a, as an exchange student overseas. And eventually, um, I was interviewed for several and got a job with um, a commercial radio and television station um, in Wollongong, which is where I had. Um, been born and, and studied and the position I got was as a cadet journalist and that was a, a position I held for a year before being promoted and um, another year went by before I was uh, hired by the ABC. So my start was pretty traditional um, and it was uh, people kept telling me I was probably one of the last journalists hired straight out of school in a, in a very old-fashioned um, cadetship style arrangement um, but it was it was a really you know, hard experience, a baptism of fire, really, because I wasn't uh, a graduate of a journalism degree, despite having um, spent, you know, over a decade myself teaching um, within journalism degrees at Australian universities. Um, I'd come straight from school. I didn't, I didn't have any real understanding of the, you know, the theoretical, um, historical context of journalism other than what I'd gleaned from popular culture and reading the old book. Um, so thrown in the deep end, reporting, um, news reading, live to air, um, within a couple of weeks of starting, I was anchoring news bulletins at the tender age of 18. And that's how it began. That's incredible. I must admit, I, I'm the next batch, so I had to do the journalism degree, I felt like, to be able to get that cadetship. Yeah. Yeah. I had that little step in between, um, which was uh, obviously a slightly, you know, different framework. So from all your experience, what do you think makes a great journalist? Is it something that you can learn? We used to talk about the craft of journalism when I was at uh, UTS studying communications in the 90s but is it much more than that that makes you know a great journalist have a successful career to do a great job what do you think it is I think one thing is certain it's changing constantly um you know but I do think at the core there are some some fundamentals that remain and um I still really value the um the grounding that you get from a great journalism degree not all journalism degrees are equal UTS um journalism Degrees are fantastic in my experience of working with graduates um, and knowing some of the lecturers there. Um, but the fundamentals are capacity to um, to tell a compelling story in an engaging way, and that is something that's difficult to learn. Often it's instinctive. 
but there are frameworks that can be learned in a in a university or cadetship or traineeship style environment. So that's um, a constant. So is um, an, an inquiring mind and, and the ability to think critically um, and to analyse detailed information swiftly. These are the skill sets we're talking about here. Um, bravery is critical. So the, the, the willingness to speak truth to power, as the um, adage goes, um, and to be aware that you know, part of your job as a journalist is to unsettle people. It's to, um, as, particularly as a news journalist, and that's been the predominant focus of my career, um, is to ask difficult questions of people in authority um, or people who are suspected of um, wrongdoing. And um, that requires um, skills as an interviewer um, that might involve, um, you know, approaches that, that range from the delicate to um the inquisitorial, and those are those again are, um, are sometimes skills that have an innate um, base, but which are learned over time through exposure and risk. And sometimes that risk is um, is life to air. If you um, like me, spent time uh, working um, on radio programs in Australia, like AM and PM, where live interviewing is a feature of the the um, journalistic skill set. So I think you still need those um, traditional um, skills along with a, um, an ethical commitment to your sources and also um, a forensic approach to, um, to accuracy, so ensuring that um, you know, the information that you have obtained is, is um, truthful and accurate. But increasingly on top of that um, basic skill set, you need to have um, a willingness and, and an openness to Audiences, which is um, a you know a really only a decade old um, understanding that traditional journalists now need to be um, equipped with the um, willingness and abilities to engage across a whole range of social platforms, for example, um, to have real time contact with people who might be the subjects of their stories, but who are also um, their, their audiences, their, their listeners, their viewers, their readers, um, and increasingly, and this is really important. Um, departure from when we trained as journalists and, and first worked as journalists, they need to be willing to collaborate with audiences to co-produce content, if you like. Yeah, I think that's totally fascinating. You've articulated the nuances so well, and I guess that leads into my next question, you know, reflecting on when you started in journalism, obviously there's always challenges in, in, in such a responsible role in many ways, but are the challenges the same or different if you're a journalist today? I think so back on those traditional um, areas of focus, those challenges remain. So um, but they have in some ways increased. So if we take you know, that pursuit of accuracy, for example, and the forensic assessment of details, um, one of the, um, the, the flip side uh, factors to all of the benefits that go with audience engagement um, through social media platforms, which help us to, um, you know, create more authentic stories and to, to diversify our sources and to ensure we have ways of distributing our content that go beyond the traditional delivery means. The flip side of um, time spent um, on social platforms and a reliance on social um, media as a series of um, source materials for journalism is that we're now in an era um which controversially is, is, is um, littered with fake news, in inverted commas. And by fake news, I do not mean the Donald Trump um, in our definition of fake news, which is any quality journalism that protects him, but rather um, this, you know, the, the, the disinformation, the misinformation, the, um, the, the deliberately false um, propagandistic um, information that is targeting not just journalists but citizenry, you know, as um, people who would who would try to hoodwink um, societies, you know, are able also to use these platforms to um, distribute false information and to frequently frequently to misrepresent um, their content as legitimate news um, items. So that presents incredible challenges for verification um, principles and disciplines and it also means um, that journalists have to, have to focus much more clearly on... Um, the challenge of, of trust, trust with audiences, um, trust that sources can have in them. And um, I think that is, is if, I, if I'm speaking from a 2017 perspective, one of the most um, challenging um, issues that we're, that we're struggling to deal with. I'm, I'm just at the moment uh, working with a, 
a colleague from the World Editors Forum on a, um, a new curriculum that we're developing for UNESCO that's based on fake news and designed to um, to equip journalism students and also uh, professional journalists with um, the skill sets necessary to, to recognise and combat that um, scourge of um, fake, false and misleading information. So that's one. Well, I think that's um, really powerful. Just to just cut in there, I no, just no, think sure. that that bit about the fake news is it's interesting, like, I even think, oh, well, I've got a really good radar for news and what, you know, what constitutes, you know, vetted information, if you like, through the standards that us as trained journalists understand better. But I think it's really blurring and I think even that responsibility that outlets like Facebook have where they kind of feel like we're not really publishers, we're just, we're just you know, sharing information. But I think there has to be some sort of responsibility and I, I'm curious to know what your view on that is. I mean, where does the buck stop when it comes to this? Look, it's really complex um, and it's, it's not black and white. Um, Facebook, I believe, is a news publisher, despite um, protestations to the contrary. They are the, you know, the, these platforms, particularly Facebook, with its extraordinary reach, um, is um, a gatekeeper, a new, a new style of gatekeeper. We used to refer to journalists and news organisations as the gatekeepers of information and this is now distributed and um, Facebook arguably is the most powerful gatekeeper we have. Um, globally, despite the fact that Facebook is, you know, blocked in um, places like China, it still has enormous um, power and reach and and enormous capacity to influence um, uh, political processes, for example. So I think that um, one of the challenges is trying to – there are two challenges here, really. One is with, with the platforms attempting to convince them that they have responsibilities um, and then attempting to assist them in – applying those responsibilities, you know, when it comes to um, curation tools and, um, you know, there's, there's the algorithm, but there's also um, human impact and, and those are things that have to be um, taken into account. Um, so Facebook needs to be convinced and then empowered to um, behave in a way that assists with um, the verification of content um, and the presentation of, um, of reliable content to audiences um, so that it's not drowned out by the kind of um, material that we've seen generated by fake news files um, during the Philippines and US elections, for example. Um, and yeah, also- they're, really, they're really great points, actually. I'm just thinking about it and I'm also, you know, really conscious of generationally. There's a whole generation of people um, from the millennials down, if you like, that don't even read newspapers, don't yeah, exactly. read traditional, watch, you know, they wouldn't watch 7.30 program, which I would watch. or And so for them, you know, social media and that reliability of information becomes key for them to make informed decisions. Absolutely. And that's the second point, really, that, um, you know, we used to talk about media literacy as um, a set of skills that um, citizens, you know, from children to adults need to have to be able to, interpret um, and analyse traditional media content, you know. Um, now, media literacy, again, has to be distributed and that needs to be, I think, um, much more um, carefully embedded in education because we have, you know, I have an eight-year-old child and you have young kids as well. And um, since my little girl was, you know, was before she was walking, she was interacting with devices that distribute content, um, you know, where there are no... Um, but I'm looking at her and I'm looking also um, at this from a from a, um, an educational or pedagogical um, perspective as well as a journalism educator that critical thinking is absent even in the you know the 18 year olds who front up um, who elect to study journalism, the sort of critical thinking that we're talking about that allows you to take information from a variety of sources and distill it and weigh it um, and verify it. Um, those, those are skills. Um, and, yes, if you've been to a, you know, through a quality journalism degree, you're likely to emerge with greater capacity than the average citizen to assess information. But we now need those kinds of skills to be um, embedded in the basic education of every citizen so that anyone, no matter whether they are, you know, a carpenter, um, a retail manager, a, you know, a CEO or a journalist or a doctor or a lawyer, you know, that everybody needs to have this basic skill set that allows you to make informed um, determinations about the validity of information and I really think, again, this is one of the critical issues of our time in terms of um, communications and the implications for democracy are already, um, you know, the subject of research after those elections that I mentioned, for example. 
The Philippines is a fascinating case study, which came before the US election, where we saw massive disruption um, and the swaying of large groups of voters as a result of um, wrong and misleading information. So um, we have the other challenge in this mix, um, which is that we know from research that people are more likely to trust information now that is distributed by their peers. So peer-to-peer -peer distribution of content happens predominantly in our culture on a platform like Facebook, um, which gets us back to the need to have the skills embedded in the, you know, the recipients of this information, the users of Facebook, and also the willingness on the part of the platform um, to, to work with um, you know, news organisations, for example, to ensure that quality, reliable, um, verified content is able to be easily surfaced so that it appears more readily in people's Facebook feeds. I think that's great. So changing tack a little bit, um, podcasting, which is obviously another subject close <laughs> to my heart, but it's become very important in the modern media mix, if you like, in the past decade or so. And I know you've worked on an award-winning podcast called Phoebe's Fall, which I've listened to. It's amazing. Anyone should go grab it and listen to it. So tell us a little bit about that process for you from a journalist lens viewpoint and also why do you think audiences are responding so much to the podcast format, even people who perhaps wouldn't watch you know, a traditional media outlet or listen to a radio program will definitely tune into a podcast. Sure. It, it, it is a really fascinating phenomenon. Um, again, I suppose just to link back to what um, we were asking initially, that um, the ability of journalists now to be um, so multi-skilled that they can really work across platforms is, is paramount. So, um, yes, I spent the last um, two years basically with Fairfax Media and one of my big projects was being embedded within the investigative um, unit at The Age um, newspaper in Melbourne because they um, wanted to experiment with podcasting um, in reference particularly to telling a really complex um, and quite heartbreaking um, story, um, which was, um, just to give your audience a, a, a clue, was um, focused on a young woman who uh, really tragically um, died um, as, as a result of either being placed in a garbage chute or placing herself in a garbage chute or somehow inadvertently ending up in a garbage chute um, high up in a luxury apartment building and um, she plummeted to her death uh, in the most graphic and gruesome um, circumstances. And they wanted to make a podcast that, that interrogated the findings of a, um, of a coronial uh, inquest and also um, that allowed them to um, re-examine um, this woman's life and the story that surrounded it. So here are a bunch of um, print journalists, um, really talented, um, extraordinary journalists. So I was really privileged to work with um, Michael Bachelard, who's the investigations editor, and Richard Baker, um, who is truly a you know a star um, investigative journalist in the sort of traditional terrier sense of <laughs> investigative journalist. Um, you need to be a bit of a terrier to be able to, I think, stomach some of that stuff and get, get through the, the bureaucracy and all the bits, the layers that must happen in that kind of reportage. Absolutely. And, um, and he, he's a classic. Um, but that, what was great was Richard, this was Richard's story. He'd worked on with Nick McKenzie, another um, fabulous and celebrated um, Australian investigative reporter. Um, it was a story that was, you know, five years old and this was, um, not not a cold case in the traditional sense, but an attempt to kind of unpack this story again. And Richard was the one who said, um, in the context of me, you know, uh, uh, walking through newsrooms in Fairfax and and um, highlighting the you know the renaissance of audio storytelling and the real power of audio storytelling, and um, suggesting that we should, as a news organisation, embrace it, um, podcasting that is. And Richard um, really wanted to to experiment with this story, so. We collaborated um, over a period of four or five months um, on this project and um, I brought in a, a colleague who's a, an ABC um, documentarian, Siobhan McHugh, um, who was a colleague from the University of Wollongong, and um, together we forged this really tight um, and highly collaborative um, production unit that was much more like a kind of, um, I suppose, a radio national approach to um, producing content than a, um, a, a, a process at a print newsroom. Um, but it was, you know, it's very, and, and it was very complex storytelling. It was very nuanced, very layered, um, and from a sound production point of view, it was, you know, these sorts of podcasts where we're chatting are fantastic uh, and they can be really high impact. Um, you know, one end of the spectrum 
uh, when it comes to chat-based podcasting or interviewing podcasting, you've got shows like the ABC's The Conversation, and then there are lots of really interesting um, shows like yours, Amber, where people are delving into issues and characters. But at the other end, you've got really sort of craft-based audio um, production techniques, and this Baby's Fall was in that realm. So back to your question about why people are engaging with it, I think, um, you know, I spent um, 13, 14 years as a, as a uh, predominantly radio journalist with the ABC, and um, I learned really early on as a, as a traditional radio journalist, news and current affairs, that there is something quite special about the audio media in the way that it, <clears throat> pardon me, it levels. You know, you're not, you, you have to suspend judgment about the way somebody looks, um, for example, if you're an audience member. Like, unlike engaged. TV where I spent a brief and mm. not my favourite time in my career, it's I was at uh, <laughs> yeah. and it was still in the days where, um, you know, it's to an extent still true, but it was still in the days where it really mattered how you looked. I mean, I yeah. could be talking yeah. about, you know, people um, in war torn countries and then people would write in and not like my hair that day. I mean, it just exactly. distracted me. Yeah, I'm look at my, my transition was, was with um, a regional television station um, and radio station and, and the, the, what I saw through the uh, TV newsroom was extraordinary, um, even at a regional level. It was, you know, the, the Supreme Court murder case was um, always eclipsed by the, the, the jacket the presenter was wearing that night. So, I um, yeah, look, I think the suspension of, of judgment that comes with um, the absence of the visual, which really requires you to listen. Listening is such an underrated um, element of communication, but it requires you to listen intently um, and you engage with the, you know, the tone and the tenor of, um, of, of um, a person's voice. And there's something really essentially human about, you know, the voice that, that draws you in in ways that, um, you know, can be, Visuals can distract from that kind of engagement, and we're always talking in contemporary media about the importance of engagement. That means you know a fully connected um, experience for an audience member. And what we know from research and practice is that um, quality audio storytelling, whether it's a really meaningful conversation with an individual or something more um, produced and nuanced, um, like Phoebe's Fall, people engage really, you know, really closely with that material. So I think that comes down to what I learned really early on as a radio journalist, that there are um, two elements that now even traditional print newsrooms are trying to bring into their text-based reporting Intimacy and conversationality, those are the, the, the two elements that I think traditional radio um, broadcasting has and had over all of the other mediums. And that's, I think, what people are getting um, reconnecting with through podcasting. It's, you know, it's got, it's got power to expose you to the most raw human emotions in ways that text never will be able to. Um, and it um, has, you know, the ability to allow you to slow down, you retreat, you know, if you put the earbuds in, um, it, it's a very personal experience, I think, consuming audio storytelling. You've got, you know, the voice in your head, um, you feel, a, you know, a distinct connection if it's done well um, with the personal people at the other end of those earbuds. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that, um, you know, good radio broadcasters will um, talk about the, the genuine connection and relationship that they have with their audiences. So there's a lot that you can hear in this kind of language that we now understand as being fundamentally important to all manner of storytelling, right? It's engagement. Exactly. Um, and that engagement yeah. piece, I think for me personally, I love podcasts. I mean, I never worked in, it's the one medium I never worked in professionally was radio. And so now I've got a podcast and I get to do that. But uh, <laughs> I must admit, it's the intimacy of radio. It's also fact and this is probably a sign of the times I can multitask I could have a great podcast on and I could be cooking dinner or I could be driving to my next meeting and I feel like I'm getting a little bit of something for me um but it's also not making me have to be glued to a screen if that makes sense absolutely, as well absolutely yeah I mean um I do it too while while driving um I, and this is also you know how I used to consume radio the beauty of it now is it's on demand you know podcasting is you know, it's on the device that you're with um, and, and uh, you know, you listen as, as, as and when you choose. So, you know, so I have a friend who, um, this is, this is going to sound like a sort of Tony Abbott domestic um, worker style <laughs> comment here, but, um, but people I know who would program their ironing around a particular radio national show, you know, well, now they'll just put on a podcast when they're ready to do the ironing. And there's something, I mean, I'm talking here about um, I've got a, a colleague and a friend who's a, um, in mind when I say this, who is a, you know, a fierce feminist and a 
um, a professional woman, but but there's something about the, the sort of methodical process of ironing and being able to deeply engage with uh, with audio storytelling that works. And that, we, we kind of knew that, you know, as um, as radio broadcasters that we had audiences who were just usually distracted by other tasks. They were cooking, they were ironing, they were mowing, they were on a tractor, you know, they were driving. Um, and and uh, increasingly now, of course, they're, they're commuting, they're running, they're um, in the bath, wherever they are. Hopefully not in the bath because that would be dangerous. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that sums it up beautifully. So changing a little bit to, again, our angle, I know for you in your in your career, asylum seekers and refugees have been key themes in your reportage. I am curious to know why these stories that uh, you've pursued, you know, why this area, this arena versus, say, business news or political reporting, which I'm sure you could be equally competent at, what was it about these kinds of stories which have really, you know, captured you and made you feel compelled to tell them? Um, good question. I, I was briefly a business reporter, but um, and in fact, my last task at Fairfax was to um, to produce, to executive produce an economics um, podcast with Ross Gittins and um, Jess Irvine and Matt Wade, which was um, a lot of fun and I learned a lot. <laughs> but it's true that um, business and economics um, and finance, for example, have not been, um, along with sport, have not been my favourite areas of concentration. Um, and I, that said, um, politics is actually um, core to my, my practice and my interest. I was a political reporter with the ABC. Um, in Canberra for um, for some time, but even in that role, um, you're absolutely right. It was um, themes that we might term kind of um, social justice journalism oriented that um, were my focus. So even as a, a traditional political reporter, um, I tended to focus on issues like multiculturalism, Indigenous affairs, um, um, and um, policy issues around. Um, you know, inequality, I suppose, um, and industrial relations. And um, at the beginning of my career, I uh, did a lot of work. Um, yeah, racism, anti-racism has been a constant theme, um, and that's what you um, see, you know, reflected in work I've done on um, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, same with reportage on the rise of Pauline Hanson in the 90s. Um, I did a series for AMA. back again. So it's like, it does repeat itself. Totally, I know. And all of it, having to, people are ringing me and asking me about, what, how is it different now? <laughs> it's really not that different. Um, but, um, but look, all of this, this um, stems from, um, I suppose, what I relate to a vocational calling to be a journalist. I mean, I was inspired in a very cliched way to be a journalist by a deep desire to um, to effect change and to do that in the interests of, according to my philosophy, um, social justice and um, and truth. And um, and that stems in and of itself from a, um, a sort of philosophical um, grounding in, um, you know, what, what you might think of as liberation theology. So um, having, you know, been brought up in a... Um, in a, in a um, traditional Christian, I suppose, um, household in my teens um, and desperately um, exploring connections to what I believe politically and philosophically were the pressing issues. You are the author of a major UNESCO study, Protecting Journalism Sources in the Digital Age, which published in 2017. Why did you decide to invest your expertise in this particular area? And I guess... The second part of that is, have journalist sources always been protected better than now? Or what are the challenges of the digital world that, that you think had to be, you know, studied and you wanted to shine a light on? Um, well, again, look, this is a really complex um, area and I um, undertook this study when I was in Paris um, or began it when I was in Paris with the World Editors Forum and the World Association of News Publishers. Um, they were contracted by UNESCO to examine the state of um legal source protection frameworks um, around the world. And the idea was that um, we'd be able to leverage the network of um, news organisations that were members of um, the World Editors Forum and World Libra, as it's um, abbreviated. And I was then uh, there as the research editor and research fellow. So, um, uh, and I was very keen to do, to do this study. So we um, agreed to undertake it and I produced it and led it and um, I wrote it um, and it, it turned into a beast, a mammoth piece of work because it um, became very clear very quickly that it wasn't just going to be a, um, an assessment of legal frameworks that um, 
you know, that, that basically um, annotated existing information about where um, source protection laws existed around the world um, or journalists' privilege, as it's often known. And for those people listening who don't know what I'm talking about, because it is a kind of narrow area of law, we're talking yeah, here about... Exactly. That's good, good to unpack that, I yeah, think. We're talking here about laws um, and, uh, and ethical um, norms that require a journalist to protect the people who have given them information as confidential sources, um, information generally speaking designed to um, illuminate some you know, hidden area of corruption, for example, um, or some kind of abuse of power. Um, whistleblowers, for example, are a big subset of journalists' confidential sources. So these laws exist to prevent um, journalists from having to um, willy-nilly hand over identification identifying material about their sources, so allow them to actually protect the identity of their sources. Now, in Australia, if a source is revealed, you know, jail or um, loss of employment, um, fines could be consequences in many countries around the world. Um, you know, extrajudicial killings, murder, uh, could be consequences um, for the revelation of a confidential source's identity. So th these ultimately are very important issues. They go to the heart of um, the sustainability of investigative journalism. Um, and, and, you know, are critical um, features of um, freedom of expression rights and sustainability of democracy, frankly. So these are big issues. Um, but what we found very quickly as we started down this path was that this was not going to be just a simple exercise of um, updating databases um, with laws and, and identifying where important cases had been determined. It, it became an investigation into the overreach of national security and anti-terrorism legislation or the um, undermining impact of data retention um, policies around the world, um, of the you know, corrosive impacts of surveillance, um, mass surveillance and targeted surveillance. So in the digital context, we have a situation where some argue it's actually impossible now for journalists to be able to protect their sources because um, national security organisations are routinely um, targeting um, people suspected of um, being whistleblowers, for example. Um, they are um, journalistic information and communications are being swept up in mass surveillance. So, you know, our conversation here could be being um, reported. We don't know by whom um, or for what purpose. Um, it, but if this was a conversation I was having with a confidential source, I would not be doing it on a crowdsourced, um, you know, podcasting platform. I'd be resorting to encrypted communications because of concerns about detection. Um, so whereas in the past traditionally a journalist would meet a physical source um, in an environment where um, they were less likely to be detected, now because journalism is produced largely through digital communications means, our sources are much more exposed potentially. Um, and we are also in an environment where um, fear of terrorism is allowing um, states, governments, to um, to justify um, breaching traditions and laws that are designed to protect those um, communications between journalists and their sources. So it's um, getting much harder to protect your sources. Um, we know this in Australia um, through the metadata debate um, and the revelation earlier um, this year that the Australian Federal Police, for example, had um uh, interrogated a journalist's metadata um, from their telephone. So, um, oh, we are, we're not immune is what, what I'm hearing. We're not, not only are we not immune, I think in some ways um, Australian journalists and, and whistleblowers are potentially more vulnerable because we are part of an alliance called the Five Eyes, which is an alliance of security agencies um, between Australia, New Zealand, Britain um, and uh, Canada. And I think I've left somebody out there, the US, <laughs> a very important <laughs> oversight. Um, and so those agencies collaborate and share information, making us potentially more vulnerable. Um, that's a very powerful um, set of spy agencies and capabilities there. So without wanting to, um, you know, cause too much alarm, uh, and, and I assure you I'm not your, your classic um, tinfoil hat wearer, but these are really potent issues. And, I mean, when the UN commissions work on this and ultimately publishes a an 80,000 word tome on um, the implications of all this in a post Snowden environment, um, Edward Snowden being the, one of the most famous whistleblowers of our time, um, who revealed that this kind of information interception and data gathering was happening. Um, I think, you know, it's time to, to sit up and take notice. And so one of my missions over the past um, 
uh, year um, since the, the study was published um, has been to try and raise awareness within newsrooms and within whistleblower organisations and with government about the need to um, to offset um, some of these measures with a commitment to um, continue the, the practice and tradition of recognising the importance of confidential sources and the ability of those confidential sources to reach out to journals. Terrific. So um, thinking a little bit about the future of journalism, I particularly uh, have some concern for our younger generation in terms of, you know, the aspiring journalists who are going to want to go and do what we've done before, but with very different rules, if you like. What do you think the future of journalism looks like? I mean, is there any kind of signs that this, this doom and gloom, which particularly is surrounded, say, you know, the traditional newspaper space where people have, you know, a lot of journalists have been, seen people have been let go and um, that doesn't seem any sign of abating. I mean, is there anything you can see that's going to kind of help that next generation? I mean, what's it going to be like? Look, um, I've been, you know, been in Fairfax, as you know, for the last couple of years, and um, many, many journalists um, have taken redundancy, um, and that is, you know, as part of a, um, a seismic shift, a recalibration of um, traditional news organisations that we're seeing around the world. Um, downsizing is a, is a feature, um, and you know, we could talk for hours about the, the crisis confronting journalism, um, but I remain um, optimistic about the the um, future of journalism in a sense that um, you know investigative journalism you know is 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 like a cockroach that will never go away I think um, that and that and neither should it I think that's an important point to make because one thing I'm really clear about is that good journalism investigative journalism it takes time there are a lot of rabbit holes and not everything produces content and in a content obsessed world yes. the danger is we you know in in the essence of wanting to keep profits going and obviously that's an important part of keeping media buoyant but we actually cut that off and I think when we do that we're really losing a lot about what makes you know journalism work. Yeah um, absolutely and I think um, while there will always be a desire for um, quality investigative journalism on the part of audiences and we see that time and time again in the context of crises when they're you know um, you know, disasters or um, and post-disaster relief, for example, or whether they're, um, you know, massive corruption scandals that um, expose injustice. People want and need that information. Um, journalists um, want to produce that content. But we are certainly going to see a diversification of the kinds of, um, you know, environments in which that information is produced. So I mentioned Amnesty International before. Amnesty International is producing really um, quality investigative journalism um, from areas of the world where traditional journalists either can't go or are not being sent by their employers. Um, so we're seeing a kind of um, um, a distribution of those processes and tasks. But what I'm wanting to say is I'm not just optimistic about ultimately the future of journalism, although it is likely to look quite different to what we've known and understood to be professional journalism over the past um, century and a half, for example. I'm very optimistic for young people studying journalism because there are new and different and more opportunities to enter journalism um, in different ways than, than there were when we were young and seeking a traditional cadetship um, or traineeship. So um, what I mean by that is, you know, young young graduates of journalism programs can um, work in in and across all manner of organisations doing um, work, good, you know, quality storytelling work. They can um, come into traditional media through new um, placements, like, you know, social media editor. Um, you know, you might have started a newspaper as an audio producer because there's no sort of traditional skill set inside a newspaper um, to support podcasting, which is absolutely burgeoning. So I'm I'm, while I'm really troubled by the sort of convergent crises afflicting journalism from business model collapse to uh, fake news to um, you know, the, the, the sort of increasing threats to journalists' safety um, globally, all of these things are massive challenges. That the assault on freedom of expression rights huge, but um, fundamentally there is a, a, a willingness and um, I think a collective understanding. Um, that we need to defend is particularly at the core of quality investigative journalism. And um, and I just remain optimistic about the capacity of society to figure out new ways of funding it, new ways of doing it, new ways of supporting it. Um, and I still think it's, you know, being able 
to tell important stories that make a difference is such a, an, a you know such a vocational calling, but such an important contribution to society. Um, and it's the best job going, really. Still, I think <laughs> if you can make. Oh, a I love it too. I know my passion for journalism runs deep. And it's interesting you say that about you know Amnesty producing content. Just as a little side tip, I went to some forum. You m- might have heard this as well. The, actually, the biggest employer of cadet journalists is actually the banks at the moment. So um, yeah. that's quite interesting. And I, I, you know, I'm hoping that, that that's for good. And, um, you know, not all banks are evil, of course. They do some great things in communities, but it's just, and we all need banks because, you know, that's how the world works. But I just thought that was totally fascinating. I would never have considered that 20 years ago when I was going into yeah. my career. Yeah. Yep, and I think that's one of the things that um, that journalists can bring to all manner of organisations and, you know, to policy departments of government is, is that ability to um, assess information, to verify information and to weave a narrative around it that makes it digestible. I mean, that, that that's a pretty... You know, important contemporary skill set across a range of um, professions. Now, yeah. absolutely. Well, my final two questions are always uh, the same for my guests, and the first one is around um, any special mentors or inspirational people that have guided you. They don't have to be well-known names at all, but you know, people that have given you that kind of view and that lens of life um, that has, I guess, inspired you in some way. Are there any people that come to mind, and what have they taught you about the business of journalism and life? Um. Well, this is not a name that is necessarily household in um, Australian journalism, but my very first mentor is somebody I still occasionally touch base with. Um, we still talk about um, theories of journalism, ethical challenges. Um, it's a man named Andrew Bell who um, was a, a, a TV journalist at Win TV when I was in the radio newsroom um, that sh- you know, shared a space um, with with Win TV in Wollongong. And Andrew had just that, at that point. Um, nearly 30 years ago, I'd just come from Wales where he'd worked as a, um, a regional journalist with the BBC. And um, he was <laughs> the intellectual, um, you know, North Star in that newsroom. Um, and I gravitated immediately towards him. And he um, saw somebody who really had little clue, despite being the <laughs> kind of bright spark fresh out of school with an inquiring mind. Um, I didn't have the grounding. And he basically... Um, provided me with the, with the sort of context in a pre-internet world, the sort of context I needed, the framework I needed, um, the ability to sort of, um, I suppose, um, you know, apply theory to, to what it was that I was doing um, as, a, as a young journalist. And I just I just still think about that as, as being an incredibly um, valuable role that Andrew played um, in, in my early career. And we've kind of crossed paths. Um, over the years, and he's now back at the ABC in Canberra as a, um, a senior journalist. Um, and he won't mind me saying he's um, approaching 60 now. So, um, and he's mentored so many young journalists during that um, that time. Um, in fact, one of the students that um, I took with me to Paris um, to work as an intern at the World Editors Forum from the University of Wollongong, um, a young, talented reporter called Jake Evans, is doing his ABC traineeship in the Canberra newsroom. And um, when I knew he was going there, I immediately reached out to Andrew and said, can you be, you know, um, somebody who um, encourages him and, you know, critiques him in, in the manner that he, you, you have power to do. And he's, um, you know, he's, he's risen to that challenge as well. And I'm sure Jake really appreciates that. So I think somebody like that who quietly gives this, you know, important service to, to young journalists of, you um, always bring them back to principles and, and practices that are grounded um, in ethics and quality and detail. I mean, th- those are, um, I think, fairly journalists are criticised for, for losing focus on those things um, and he's somebody who always brought me back to them. So I think he's, he's the one I'll mention. <laughs> Perfect. I'm sure there's many more, but he sounds like a perfect role model for you. Just to wrap up, any top or final ideas that you would love to share with listeners as we wrap up? Um, Not everyone's going to be a journalist, of course, but is there anything that you'd like people to understand in the politics of journalism so that when they are watching, listening, whatever they're doing, consuming media, they have a, a, you know, have the right perspective on it? Um, yes, look, there is. I know um, we're in an environment currently where it's um, a national sport to, to um, uh, bash or critique journalists. And I will say that many journalists and in particularly some news organisations are worthy of our collective critique. Um, you know, they are not all um, shining lights um, uh, here or anywhere else. But um, I think that we as a nation need to recognise 
the extraordinary value of the best of our journalists um, when it comes to um, accountable governments, responsible businesses. Um, when you think of programs like Four Corners, um, AMP and at the ABC, background briefing, um, you know, work done by investigative journalists at The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, for example, there continues to be um, a small group of journalists who work incredibly hard in this country who have the support of big news organisations, without whom we would not know about corruption at the Commonwealth Bank, for example. We would not know about um, corruption within the police service, if you think back to the Moonlight State. We wouldn't know about the abuse of Aboriginal children in detention um, in the Northern Territory. Um, so even in a, in a world where it's possible for whistleblowers to go direct, you know, through their own platforms, we need the um, skills and the, the mass audience reach of journalists and news organisations. And I think we do ourselves a disservice if we undermine um, the importance of, of independent, um, rigorous journalism and journalists. And I've seen in my work um, internationally, uh, particularly around press freedom and freedom of expression issues and the safety of journalists, that many journalists um, risk their lives on a daily basis to do what we take for granted, which is to speak truth to power and to bring to light um, abuses and corruption um, in the interests of um, a fairer, more just society. And I think that that is the essential calling um, of a quality journalist. And most of those I know would say that that is the kind of work they want to contribute um, professionally. And so I think audiences um, do a disservice to themselves and to democracy when they, um, you know, gratuitously attack journalists and journalism. And I think journalists, on the other hand, who reject the critique of audiences when it's delivered fairly, do a disservice to the profession and undermine trust. So I think there's a, um, there's a pact that we need to re-establish here. Perfect. You've been the most exciting and eloquent guest I've had so far. It's been an absolute pleasure, Julie. If you want to connect further with Julie Pacetti, there'll be some details on my show notes. Until next time, stay strong. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.